Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, I ask you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit to abide in me, that all things that, that I have studied may come in order and in peace to my brothers and sisters. Please be with my brothers and sisters and help us with our faith to keep moving forward. Give us an understanding of your Bible prophecy and your truth and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining me in God's final message series. Today's topic is the judgment of the dead, part one. Now, this topic here is based on the seven feasts. And before I get into the seven feasts, there's a few questions uh, people ask me, and I wanted to reply to it in a sense so that we can have an understanding why we don't keep the physical seven feasts, but we keep it as a spiritual sense that points to the New Testament and the Old Testament. The first question that comes into mind was, why do we keep the Gregorian calendar instead of the Jewish calendar? So the Gregorian calendar is, is when Pope Gregory actually changed the name, the first, to the, the first day to Sunday, the second day to, to Monday. And that's the Gregorian calendar, but it's actually no difference from the Julius, Julius Caesar's can, calendar during the time of the Jews. So the reason why we keep the Gregorian calendar today, uh, in fact, well, I wouldn't say the word keep, but we are influenced by the Gregorian calendar today because everything that we go by, by the, the living costs and the way of life, is, is influenced, it's governed by that calendar. For instance, uh, the school our kids that we, the school that our kids go to, when this, on a certain date there's a public holiday, and then they, the school is shut down and the kids don't go to school. Or there's the day when the school does open and then our kids go to school. Does that mean they, they worship on a day or they keep the Gregorian calendar? Does that mean do they keep the Gregorian calendar? And the answer is yes, because we are influenced by, uh, by the calendar of the world today. The, gov the companies that we work for, when there's stats, holidays, all this is all governed by the Gregorian calendar. If you look in the time of the Jews, when the Rome was governed, when the Rome governed the Jewish nation, they were under the government of the calendar called the Julia Julius calendar. Did they keep their Jewish feast calendar, the Jewish calendar? Yes, they did. They kept both. And the reason why they had to go by both, because one, they worship God, and the other one is because they were governed or influenced by that calendar. So these are the two. If you actually look at the Jewish feast, which is actually based on the Jewish calendar, uh, you will see there are actually two calendars, the civil year calendar and the sacred year calendar, which is wha what we know as the Jewish feast. Now, the civil year calendar was the first calendar that's written in the time of Noah, when Moses was saying that this is the month of the rain or the month of the flood. That was the civil calendar. It wasn't until the time when they were free from, from slavery in the time of Egypt is when they received the sacred year calendar, or was, as we know, the Jewish feast or the Jewish calendar. Okay, so that came after. Another question is, why do we keep the Gregorian calendar instead of the Jewish? And that's why. It's because we are influenced, uh, uh, the world is influenced by the Gregorian calendar. And the Jewish calendar is totally different. For instance, the Gregorian calendar starts in January. The Jewish calendar starts around April, May. So Gregorian calendar is the earth moving around the sun or the earth moving around the light. The Jewish calendar is the light moving around the sun, the earth. So when they see the light, they go by when the light goes away and comes back, or the light uh, goes away and comes back. That's how they base their Jewish calendar, and also with the new moon, which we get the word month or moon. Amen. If you keep the seventh-day Sabbath, why don't you keep the Jewish feast? Well, because there's a lot of, diff there's a lot of distinctions from the, Jewish, from the Sabbath and the Jewish feast. For instance, the seventh day was given before sin, and as we know, that is the first weekly cycle in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. The feast of the Lord in Leviticus chapter 23 was given because of sin. And the Sabbath is a day and the feast are dates. So there's a big difference. The Sabbath was made for man according to Mark 2, 27. The feast was made for the Jews according to Leviticus 23. And, and according to Colossians chapter 2, these are shadows, the things come which was nailed to the cross. So we are the spiritual Jews. We are not the physical Jews, we are the spiritual Jews. And because we are the spiritual Jews, we do keep the seven, seven feasts as a spiritual Jews. We spiritually keep the feasts of the Lord because they point to the New Testament and the end of time. So this is how we, we, we keep the Jewish feast as a spiritual Jew. 
Galatians 3, 26 to 29, it says, For we are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to, his, according to the promise. So when we believe in Christ, that means we also become heirs to Abraham's seed, the father of faith, where God said, I will pour down the promise. Well, this is why we're ha we inherit the promise of God through Abraham. So we are the spiritual Jews. Amen. I want you to read uh, in Leviticus chapter 23. This is where the feast was given to the Jews. Now, I want you to show how he separates the Sabbath and the feast of the Lord. Now, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye, are, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. The word holy uh, convocation comes from the word convene, meaning to assemble and to gather. So when it comes to God's Sabbath, we have to assemble together. We have to gather together. So this brings a big point because some, some of us Christians say we can stay at home and have Sabbath. No, Sabbath, according to God, it is a holy convene or holy congregation where people assemble. You shall not, do, you shall not work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord and all your dwellings. Now read verse, and then in verse 4 it says, These are the feast of the Lord, even holy congregations, which you shall proclaim in their season. So the God's Sabbath, which is Saturday, the seventh day, he says, this is the Sabbath of the Lord. And then in verse 4 he goes, now let's talk about the feasts of the Lord. The Sabbath of the Lord, the feast of the Lord. Amen. So these are the feast of the Lord, even holy congregations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. Now, real quick, quick the first feast that ever be, that, that begun the Jewish calendar was the Passover. And the reason why that was uh, is referred to the Passover is because during the time of Egypt, when they were in slavery, they had to swipe the blood of the lamb on their doorposts, and the angel of death will pass by them or pass over them to save them from, the, uh, from their firstborn being, being killed. And that's what happened from, the, from then on was, a, was pointing to that because they were free from slavery. Listen real quick. The Jewish feast, or as, as, well, it's really not the Jewish feast, it's actually the feast of the Lord was given to the Jews to remind them the, of their salvation from slavery. Amen. And this is why we see this as a spiritual sense pointing to the New Testament and the, old, and in the end of time because it, is, it reminds us from the salvation to free us from sin, which is our slavery, which is our slave. Amen. So let's get into the seven feasts. The first feast that is given is the Passover. And that Passover pointed to, uh, was, was a shadow to what's coming in the New Testament. So we find in the Old Testament the blood of the Lamb. When they uh, swipe the doorpost to save their firstborn to show that they believe in God and that they, the blood of the Lamb will save them. Then, and that, that's what they had in the Old Testament. Now let's look in, the, in Exodus. This pointed to the crucifixion in Luke 22, 15. Now Luke 22, verse 14, it says, And when the hour was come, he sat down and twelve apostles with him, and he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now listen, listen carefully what he was just saying. He was referring to his death. And did you know, at the time when, when they had the Passover feast, was the same time that Jesus Christ was crucified. And get, here's the amazing thing. They picked the lamb seven days before they sacrificed it. In fact, the Pharisees, if we study, the Pharisees was actually already planning to arrest Jesus Christ and crucify him seven days before they did it. It's amazing. Exactly on the feast of Passover, was the exactly same, same month of the feast where Jesus Christ was crucified. The blood of the lamb was a shadow pointing to Jesus Christ's crucifixion. The Passover pointed to the crucifixion. Now we come to the second one, which is the unleavened bread. 
Now we find in the unleavened bread was during the time of the manna. And if we study the book of Exodus chapter 34 verse 18, it says, The feast of the unleavened bread shalt thou keep. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread, as I command thee in the time of the month of month Abib. For in the month Abib thou comest out from Egypt. So it pointed to a feast where they had to eat unleavened bread. Now leaven, leaven is referred to yeast. And in the Bible, it's also to refer to sins. And it pointed to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In fact, in Matthew, Matthew chapter 16, verse 12, it says, Then understood they how they bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but the doctrines of the Pharisees of the Sadducees. So this is referring to sin. Leaven is sin. So when they had unleavened bread, it's referred to a bread without sin. And now, who is the bread? Is Jesus Christ. John 6 verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believed on me that have everlasting life, I am that bread of life. Our father did eat manna, because remember that time in the Old Testament? Manna came down from heaven. Your father did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which co cometh down, down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So now the bread in the Old Testament was pointing to, or the manna that, that came down from heaven was pointing to the bread of life, which is Jesus Christ. Can we all say amen? Listen to this. The unleavened bread, or a bread without sin, which is the manna, was pointing to Jesus Christ. What part of Jesus Christ? After the crucifixion, what happened? What did they do to Jesus Christ's body? Now, real quick, what is when they grab the wheat and they crush it into the dough, into a dough, they grab the dough and for them to cook it, they have to put it in a oven. Or we say because Jesus is the bread of life, they, the bread of life, Jesus, they had to grab Jesus and put him in a tomb. Amen. Oh, praise God. So the unleavened bread pointed to, or the manna, that pointed to God's burial. Now let's look at the third one, which is the first fruits. And you'll find all the, the feast in Leviticus chapter three, 23. Now this pointed to the first fruits or the harvest. Now in Exodus 22, it says, Thou shalt not delay to offer the first of thy ripe fruits and, the, and of thy of thy liquors, the firstborn of thy, of thy sons, shall thou give unto me. Now it's not saying to sacrifice their firstborns. It says given unto God, let them do learn God's way, God's will. And if you look at actually Exodus chapter 22, it talks about the relationship. In fact, if you go up a few verses, you will find a verse where it says, if you borrow money from your brother, that brother cannot charge you interest. So that means that if your brother charges you interest, just tell him, look at Exodus 22 and say he just committed sin. It is a sin to charge your brothers and sisters interest. I want to emphasize that because we know we have a lot of our brothers and sisters borrowing money and never returning, even if you add interest or not. But anyway, that's beside the point. The first point, the, the first fruits is referring to at the end of the harvest, the first thing that came up, the first fruits that come out of their harvest was given unto God. Now, who is the first fruit? That pointed to Jesus' resurrection. And if we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Because remember in the time in the Old Testament, it says, David, who David, who is God's, who is a man after God's own heart, he says, the Bible says, even he is still in his tomb and has not yet ascended. So no one has ascended, has resurrected, has died and resurrected and went to heaven. And, and so Jesus did it first. So Jesus becomes that first fruit of them that slept. Now read verse 21. Verse 21 says, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. My brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is the first fruits of the dead. Amen. He is that resurrection. So let's go a little repetition here. The Passover was a, 
in the time of the blood of the lamb was a shadow of God's crucifixion. The unleavened bread during the time of the manna coming down was a shadow of the bread of life going into his tomb, the burial. The first fruits, the first of its kind of the harvest represented um, when they did the harvest in the time of Exodus was a time, was a shadow pointing to Jesus Christ being the first fruit in his resurrection. Now let's go to the fourth, the fourth feast, the day of the Pentecost, the Pentecost. If we look in the time in the book of Exodus chapter 20, it talks about God when he first spoke audibly to God, to, to the Israelites. And, and if you study the book of Exodus chapter 20, it says he came down and landed on Mount Sinai like a fire and, and rumbling of noises came and he spoke the first covenant to the Israelites. This, this pointed to the shadow, was a shadow pointing to the time. This pointing to the shadow, this moment in Exodus chapter 20, excuse me, was pointing to the time in Acts chapter 2 and 3 when, when, uh, when they started preaching, all the Jews and the Gentiles came. People that came with different tongues or different languages came and didn't understand each other. So a fire was placed above their head, which is the Holy Spirit, and they were able to understand each other. They were speaking in tongues. Now, they didn't speak a tongue that people don't understand. The, the Greek word for tongue is language. They were speaking in their own language, and other people that didn't under, under, understand their own language, when they received the fire, they started to understand everybody else's language. This is an amazing moment right now because I can speak in Samoan, and you may be not a, not a Samoan, but you will understand me in your own language. So there was a translation between you and me from my language to your language through the Holy Spirit. Oh, amen. So in John 16, verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter, the Greek word is called ad, uh, parakletos, which we get the word for advocate, is the Holy Spirit, will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Amen. So the Pentecost was a that was referred to the time when God gave his first covenant to his people was a shadow to the second covenant when people started speaking in their own language. And guess what? During that time, that was when they revealed the, the new covenant. The old covenant was a shadow to the new covenant. The harvest was a shadow to the resurrection. The manna was a shadow to his burial. The blood of the lamb on the doorpost was a shadow to his crucifixion. Can we all say amen? Now we come to the fourth feast, which is the trumpets. Now the trumpets, when you think of trumpets, according to, if we read Psalms 81, verse 1 and to 3, it says, Sing aloud unto God our strength. Make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. Take a psalms and bring hither of the temporal, the pleasant harps with the psaltery. Blow up the trumpets in the new moon and in the time appointed on the solemn feast days. And when we think of trumpets in the, time, in the time of the Israelites or in the time of the Old Testament, even in the book of Revelation when the trumpets are sounding when Jesus is coming, this trumpet was a warning sign, was a message to let everybody know judgment is coming. Amen. If you look at Jericho in the time of Jericho and the walls came down, there were seven trumpets. How many trumpets? Seven trumpets were, pre were given out to let them know they are entering into the wall of Jericho. So trumpets was a sign or we could say a message given out of judgment before the actual judgment came. Now let's go back to our chart. You will see that the, the trumpets, you will see in the trumpets that you will find, or let's go back, the Pentecost referred to the when God came down on Mount Sinai, that the first covenant was a shadow to the second covenant. And that referred to the Holy Spirit. My brothers and sisters, listen to this. We have the crucifixion. We have, after the crucifixion, was the burial. After the burial was the resurrection. After the resurrection was the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit. This is in the New Testament. But you will not find anything besides revelation of a shadow to revelation of trumpets. So we have revelation of God's blowing out his trumpets when he comes down and brings judgment to the people. We have that. But we, before that comes, we need something, a shadow to point to that. 
and the only moment that we found of the trumpets preaching out the message of God or the last message of God that God is coming, you will actually find that in history. And we know this in the message of the second coming that was found in William Miller in 1833 to 1843. So let's go into the, start, the history of William Miller. At the Battle of Plattsburgh, where vastly outnumbered American forces overcame the British, the fort I was, I was exposed to every shot, bomb, rockets, sharpened shells, fell as a thick as hailstones. He said one of these many shots had exploded two feet from him, wounding, listen to this, one of the many shots, one of these many shots had exploded two feet from him, wounding three of his men and killing another. But Miller survived without a scratch. Miller came to view the outcome of this battle as miraculous and therefore at odds with the deistic view of the distant God far removed from human affairs. He, late, he, late, he later wrote, It seemed to me that the supreme being must have watched over the interests of this country in a special manner and delivered us from the hands of our enemies. So surprising a result against such odds did some to me like the work of a mightier power than man. So what happened is that when he was at war in the Battle of Plattsburgh, this bomb came and exploded, and three of his men um, either wounded or died, but there was not one scratch on him. And he knew that that had to do with the mighty power of God and not man. Why am I speaking of William Miller? Because William Miller was an atheist, and then after he became a Baptist minister, ordained as a minister, and he was the first minister to understand the key of Bible prophecy. Let me repeat this. William Miller was the first Baptist minister to reveal the key of Bible prophecy in 1833. That means before that, no one knew and understand how to unlock Bible prophecy. So what is the key that William Miller found about the Bible prophecy? And here's the key that he found that all denominations has actually used for. That is one day equals a year in Bible prophecy. William Miller was the one that unfolded, unlocked that key, which helped so many believers nowadays to reveal Bible prophecy. But before then, no one understood it. This was the foundation of the great Advent movement of 1844. The falling of the stars in 1833 gave added force to the proclamation of the message of soon coming Savior. Through the labor of William Miller and many others in America, in America of 700 ministers in England, in Bengal, in other Germany, in Gossen, and, and as follows in France and Switzerland. See what I mean about the trumpets? The trumpets, the message is preached out to all the world, to all the nations. William Miller, when he unlocked the key of Bible prophecy, it was England, Bengal, Germany, France, and Switzerland, and Scandinavia. All these, all these countries and, and cities actually started to preach the same message that William Miller preached. Amen. A few hundred miles away from Low Hampton, New York, a farmer or a former army officer named William Miller was just beginning a new career as a preacher. He was telling the world what he had discovered in the prophecies, that Christ was coming soon, yes, within 10 years. So in 1833, he said, within 10 years, Christ is coming. In 1843, Miller first published work that a 64-page pamphlet appeared in 1833. That was the year he received his license to preach, and his traveling preaching and correspondence were exceedingly rapidly, uh, ex increasingly rapidly. Listen to this. Watch this. William Miller, in 1833, started to preach this message, a Baptist minister. On the first day of the seventh month, ten days before the Day of Atonement occurred, was the Feast of Trumpets. Wait a minute. You mean in 1833, in September 14, 1833, William Miller started preaching out about the judgment, about Jesus' coming, about the second coming, Jesus' coming. And, and all countries, Switzerland, France, and Germany, started to follow along. The time he preached was the time of the Feast of the Trumpets. And I, I don't know if he, he knew this or not, but it's amazing how... When the feast occurred in that year, the Jew during the time of the Jewish calendar, when the feast occurred that year was the same time he started preaching Jesus' coming in 1843. 
Never did rain fall thicker than the meteor fell towards the earth, east, west, north, and south. It was the same in the word. It was the same in the word, in the world. The whole heaven seemed to in motion. The this, the display, as described in Professor Simlin's journal, was seen was seen all over North America from two o'clock until broad daylight. An ins incessant play of dazzling, brilliant luminosities was kept up in the whole heaven. So what, what I just actually explained to you, my brothers and sisters, in, in, in September 1833, he preached the trumpets. At the time of the feast, he preached, God is coming in 1843. And that November that year, there was a rain, one of the seals, one of the, the one of the, the rain meteorites started to pour down and that was confirmation that this was part of God's Bible prophecy being revealed in 1833. William Miller began officially sounding the first angel's proclamation in 1833 with a loud voice when the falling of the stars from the sky which occurred that same year. Amen. So we see here the trumpets was was pointing to William Miller preaching the message Jesus Christ is coming in 1843. That pointed to was a shadow pointing to the three angels message in 1860 and 1863 because the three angels message is the last message that we preach to all kindred tongues and nation. But get this, when 1843 came, it didn't happen. It didn't materialize. Now, after, the, after that, a day of atonement came. That's the, that's the sixth feast, the day of atonement. That referred to the judgment of the day in 1844. Now, the reason why, now I want to explain what happened in 1843. Now, in 1843, the William Miller came and he said, he's, Jesus Christ is coming in 1843. Did Jesus Christ come? No, he didn't. Then they did their studies, and then they realized that they forgot to add a year because you, when you come from B.C., there's a zero, and then A.D., you have to add a year. So he started preaching again the last second, the second coming that Jesus Christ is coming in 1844 because they forgot to add a year. And so the, this happened, and Jesus Christ did not come in 1844. So history tells us that they refer to this as the great disappointment. The reason why they call this the great disappointment, because many denominations started to believe that Jesus Christ was actually coming in 1844. This is not a Seventh-day Adventist movement. This is a denomination, because remember at this time, William Miller was a Baptist minister. The Seventh-day Adventist didn't come to 1860, 1860 to 1863. And this is not Ellen G. White's uh, a movement as well. She was part of the movement, but she wasn't the one that proclaimed it. It was William Miller. She was part of the movement at the age of 17 years old. Amen? So here, this is why they call it the Great Disappointment in 1844. So was William Miller wrong? Well, he was slightly wrong that it wasn't referring to, to God coming down, the second coming bringing judgment. In fact, at 1844, Let's read. Let me show you what history tells us. The dates were then recalculated, and it was realized that this prophecy pointed towards 1844, not 1843. Again, the message of judgment went to the world. When this date also did not materialize, most followers of the message fell away. But a few remained, and through diligent studies, they were led to recognize that the prophecy points towards the heavenly sanctuary. This is day of the atonement. The word atonement comes from at one with, with God. Atonement. So when, during 1844, you'll find that Jesus Christ actually went into heaven, into the most holy place, and became the high priest, became the judgment. Now, before I continue, the sanctuary in the Old Testament, there are two services, a daily service and a yearly service. A daily service is where a, a man who committed sin kills the lamb and the priest grabs the blood of the lamb, takes it into the sanctuary and, 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 and sprinkles it on the veil. And that's a daily service. And at the end of the year, or we will say at the, the end of mankind, the the priest will actually come, will kill the lamb, will actually kill the lamb or kill the goat and take the blood of the lamb or the goat and take it into the most holy place and sprinkle the blood on the sanctuary, the mercy seat. 
Now that happens once a year. Now the reason why they happen once a year, because when the priest comes at the end of the year and places the blood on the mercy seat, that's referred to that all the sins that were forgiven has been judged. And the sanctuary is cleansed. Let me share this in another sense. My daughter, who actually, my daughter wrote, was scribbling on the wall. And I got upset, and I, and I told her off. I go, don't you ever scribble on the wall. And she, she apologized, and I go, it's okay. I forgive you. And she went on her way. So now her sins are forgiven, but the scribble is still on the wall. It's not until I go and cleanse it, amen. It's not until I go and clean it, then it's done away with. And that's what the yearly sanctuary is, because at the end of the year, they go to the most holy place and they, they pour the blood on the mercy seat, the mercy seat, to cleanse the sanctuary. And all that blood, all that sins that was referred to the blood and on the veil, it goes towards the scapegoat. And they lay their hands on the scapegoat and the scapegoat will, will go into a desolate place or the wilderness and all their sins is gone into the scapegoat, scapegoat and the sins in the sanctuary are no longer exist because it is cleansed. Amen. How about your rubbish? When our rubbish is filled up in our house, what do we do with our rubbish? We take it outside the house. But it's still in our thoughts and our mind that we still have to get rid of the rubbish. Even though it's outside of our house, it's still in our property. We have to wait once a week till the rubbish dump comes and takes it away. Likewise with the daily service and the yearly service. We have, they have to wait once a year until their, their sins are actually judged righteously and the sanctuary cleanse. So this is where in Revelation 11 verse 17 saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art the and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou should give reward unto thy servants, the prophet, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. My brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ becomes the high priest, the minister of sanctuary. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. My brothers and sisters, as you see the trumpets, the message of the second coming that William Miller preached forth was a shadow was a shadow to the three angels' message that we preach through all nations, kindreds, and tongues. Now we, in the day of atonement, which is the, the judgment of the dead, when, when Jesus, Christ ent Jesus Christ entered into heaven in 1844, because it's in 1844 and the veil was open and, 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 he, was, and he, the, he was in the time of the ark, they saw, the, saw him with the ark of the covenant. That shows the Ark of the Covenant, which is in the most holy place, meaning that now Jesus has not just become the mediator between God and man, but he's also become the judge. And when he entered in there, all the sins before then has been judged. All the things that happened, judgment of the dead, those who passed away, judgment was sealed for those before him. Now listen carefully. Judgment began in 1844, the judgment of the dead. So here's a question that came up. So how was people judged in the Old Testament? Well, they weren't pretty much judged, but actually punished or forgiven of their sins. If you look at this, everything was forgiven. Remember I said like, for instance, when people, when people commit a crime in New Zealand and they go into prison, but they're not, they, and they wait for their sentence until the court comes, the court case comes, and then they're sentenced, they're sentenced, sent, but they're waiting for that sentence. Likewise, in those times, people were being forgiven, people were being punished, things were going, going as planned, but judgment wasn't complete until Jesus entered into the most holy place and became the high priest or the minister of sanctuary, the true tabernacle, the judge of all, to judge those. That was the judgment of the living from, from, for all those before 1844. But all this, as you see, was a shadow of the judgment of the living in 2017. Now, this topic here is going to be preached by our pastor, by Pastor Willie Papu Sr. And you have to understand 
does this everything is a foreshadow of what's already came in the New Testament and was yet to come soon too. Now, crucifixion happened, the burial happened, resurrection happened, the Holy Spirit happened, the three angels message in 1860, it happened, the judgment of the living in 2017, it happened. The tabernacle, as we refer to, was God's plan in the beginning, which is the second coming. Now look at this. I want you to look at this diagram. The message of the second coming, Willem Miller should have, was preaching the second coming, but what he should have preached was the judgment of the dead when Jesus Christ entered into the most holy place in 1844. Now, three angels' message come, and we're preaching in the last message that Jesus is coming, but we should be also preaching the judgment of the living. So it, it parallels the old ways, the, the, old, the old way and the new way, it parallels with each other. Here's the point I'm trying to share with you. Everything has been fulfilled. All what is left is the tabernacle where God dwells with his people, where we will be one with God at the end of days, the second coming. God's word is true to its core, my brothers and sisters. Now, I don't expect you to, to believe, to get this straight away. I, I, I humbly ask to please go and, and watch, every, watch it again until it sinks in. And then research it yourself just so it can sink in more. Remember I said, don't just believe everything that you hear from any man, uh, ministers or pastors, even me, but go and search everything. This is how you build your faith. You build your faith by not just listening, not just to come to church. You build just your faith by getting involved. You build your faith by allowing Jesus Christ to be the decision maker of your life. You tried you, now try God. Jesus Christ is our Savior. The seven feast is a deep topic that I believe everybody should know because it reveals in our time as well. We are in the day of Bible prophecy, my brothers and sisters. And ministers may say, no, this is not Bible prophecy. Don't believe everything you hear on the media. In fact, go and search everything. I know for a fact everything that I'm sharing with you is true to its core. It's Bible. It's history. But it means nothing if you don't have the core of everything, relationship. This feast was given to the Jews so that it may teach them to have a relationship with God. We are a spiritual Jews that we believe in a seven feast that points to a New Testament and the end of days. But it's a point to tell us that this is the feast, a spiritual feast to teach us how to have a relationship with God. We must believe in his crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection, the Holy Spirit most of all, the Holy Spirit. We must believe in the, in the judgment that is coming, the message that God has preached, and definitely his second coming. Where are you? Where do you stand? What do you believe? What is stopping you? What is holding you back? What is it that you can't let go? You know for a fact why you're not one with God. You know for a fact why you, you're having trouble with having a, a relationship with God. Let me repeat this again. You know for a fact, and you know for you know the reason why you are not close with God. So those that say that they don't know how to pray to God, you know why. Because there's, a, there's some things that you have to learn to let go first to have an understanding how to talk to God. It's hard to talk to God and see God when your life is full with something else. Let go and let God. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you, God, so much for this topic. I ask you, Lord, to please be with us every step of the way as we come to the last week of God's final message series. Give us the strength. Give me the strength. Be with my brothers and sisters. May you empower them every step of the way to move to the next level of their faith. In Jesus' name, we will serve and praise. Amen.